Well, thank you very much in, in, indeed, and thank you for the short introduction and for not embarrassing me at all, which is a, a relief. Well, can I start really by thanking for myself and also on behalf of everybody here, Brown Rudnick for um, sponsoring and organizing this event and also thank the trustees in particular for all that they do along with the volunteers to ensure that this charity operates effectively. Um, the topic tonight, as, as I read it on the materials that were sent to me, um, was that books are irresistible. And uh, I appreciate that um, there's a bit of a sandwich tonight. You have Lord Thomas is the top slice. I'm definitely the bottom slice, but the filling the filling is um, Richard Suskind, and I was slightly nervous about what Richard might say. Uh, as, as you know, he, he is the uh, technology advisor uh, to the Lord Chief Justice, and as was mentioned, he in fact has been technology advisor to every Lord Chief Justice since Lord Bingham. And um, his advice is invaluable, but I know that it can be extremely frustrating for Richard um, because he gives advice which doesn't immediately or indeed sometimes ever materialize into action and change. And the thing that I have to remind myself of from time to time, and regrettably Lord um, uh, uh, Richard Suskind, um, is uh, something that Lord Thomas told me uh, when I succeeded him as Lord Chief Justice. He said, Ian, in the end, it's all about money. And regrettably, there is a lot of truth in that. And squeezing money for necessary technological change is difficult enough. Squeezing it for desirable change that is looking forward into the future ha has proved to be um, beyond, I think, successive. Uh, Lord Chief Justices, and that is something which uh, uh, I think all of us uh, regret. But books are irresistible. I was a little nervous that uh, Professor Suskind might say that they are entirely resistible, and I would, had he done so, have teased him, because I know what his study looks like. And he's got more books, I think, than almost anybody I know. And the striking thing, of course, is that uh, on the even smaller Kindle that he has at the moment, smaller than the ones we have at home, that could contain probably hundreds, thousands of times the volume of material he has in his extremely large library. But for all the reasons that uh, he identified, with which I agree entirely, books are irresistible. And uh, it's coming up to Christmas. I've been asked by members of my family what on earth can we get you? It's always impossible for them. There are only ever three things I say. One is books, and I faithfully cut out uh, reviews from newspapers and leave them around the house so people get the hint. The other is CDs. I don't, I'm afraid, download music. Again, I have the same habit of just wanting to put it on something and then listen to it. And I'm afraid to say the third is a decent bottle of wine, but we won't, we, we won't go there. Now, I was given quite a long list of things I might talk about tonight, um, but uh, when, when, when I bumped into um, Sir Ross Cranston downstairs, I can't see him now, but I know he's here, um, he gave me one very clear instruction. He said, for goodness sake, be brief. Everyone will want to have another drink, so I, I will try um, to, to be brief. Just a couple of topics, and I hope no more than a few sentences on each before I, um, <clears throat> before I introduce the, um, the, the essay uh, prize. Um, the, the first is that the work of this charity in providing books across the world, and particularly to the Commonwealth and common law jurisdictions, fits beautifully with the work we do in the judiciary to support foreign jurisdictions. We have a very active international program, which includes sending judges around the world, now more often 
visually and digitally uh, to help train uh, other judges and lawyers sometimes in countries who say they can benefit from our experience. And it's an enormously uh, exhilarating thing for those who do it. And we're asked to do it in more and more and more places. And so it obviously is seen as being of some benefit to the countries in which we do it. But providing legal texts is absolutely critical. And as Lord Thomas indicated, it's, it's not only the core common law works that people are keen to have, um, but also, as you know, in many countries across the world, legislation from the United Kingdom is, is often taken as the model for legislation that is enacted locally. And no doubt that's why the first uh, request was for uh, a textbook on company law. And so this really is extremely valuable. And I think one has to recognize that uh, even in countries which appear to be developing fast and are not necessarily the poorest in the world, providing legal texts to lawyers, to universities, uh, as well as to judges, is enormously valuable. And so thank you for doing that. It's also going to continue to be valuable, even if Richard's brave new world is with us by 2030. Um, because what one can't do is provide somebody with an out-of-date digital copy of something, because it really won't exist. And um, one of the problems with online legal resources at the moment um, is that they are actually relatively expensive. The time will come, I don't doubt, when they're more ubiquitous and the legal publishers will begin to make them available uh, internationally at um, lower rates, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Now, you mention diversity, just a few, a few words on diversity, if I may. It's a topic that I have spoken about fairly frequently, uh, particularly, of course, diversity within the judiciary, which is a, a, a very big topic. The judiciary in the United Kingdom, in England and Wales, is a second career. That actually is one of its strengths and one of the reasons why it's so respected around the world. But the consequence of that is that when the Judicial Appointments Commission recommends candidates for appointment to fee-paid roles, these are the part-time practitioners who sit a few weeks a year as a judge, they're generally looking at people who are in their 40s, rarely younger, sometimes a little bit older. And when the Judicial Appointments Commission is recommending candidates for appointment to salary judicial roles, they're more likely to be people who are in their late 40s or 50 or early 50s. And so the diversity of the judiciary is to some extent conditioned. It's certainly massively influenced, first by the diversity in the legal profession at its senior ranks. And also, if you think about it, what matters enormously, given the age ranges that are recruited to the judiciary, is what was happening 25 or 30 years ago in schools or in universities, which conditioned those going into the legal profession a long time ago. And so quite apart from looking at the immediate needs to improve the diversity, and critically, I think social diversity is one of the factors that isn't given enough attention for the judiciary. Uh, we in the judiciary um, are concerned to make it clear that we wish there to be greater diversity amongst those who are entering the legal profession. And, and, and to that end, uh, many judges, including me, uh, visit schools. I'm going to be visiting one next week in, in Liverpool, as it happens. And the schools I visit are always schools which are in areas of social deprivation. There's no point in my going and visiting uh, an upmarket private school or uh, a high-achieving grammar school 
lovely though that would be because the kids there don't need encouragement to think about going into the into the law and we also have 129 community and diversity relations judges from tribunals from courts who visit schools all the time who engage with universities and so on and so this is simply something that um, is at the heart of what we do because we recognize that so far as the judiciary is concerned um, it's important that the judiciary reflects as best it can the society it serves that engenders confidence but importantly also there is a huge pool of talent in the legal profession which is more diverse than the judiciary we have at the moment and which is not being attracted in the numbers that we think they should be but at the start of it is diversity at the beginning of the process diversity amongst those who are going from school to university to read law or who go to university and do something different but then think they might go into the law so i think that's enough about diversity and i'm conscious that i'm about to breach um, ross cranston's uh, injunction to be uh, brief a couple of sentences on, on, on technology. Everyone will understand that during the pandemic, uh, we had to use technology in a way that had simply not happened before. It might astonish you to know that last March, March 2020, that is, um, in most of our courts and tribunals, most of the judges were not even equipped with telephones that could do conference calls. And that, that, I mean, that's how antediluvian we were, and that was the consequence of underinvestment. So quickly, uh, that was dealt with. And then we used commercially available video platforms, Skype and Zoom and Teams and so on. And then we rolled out uh, a slightly more advanced system, and we're continuing to do that. But I agree entirely with Richard's observation that doing cases remotely is excellent in some circumstances. Often it's a question of having some of the participants attending remotely, but not all. It's not a remote hearing or normal hearing. The, the hybrids are the most common. Um, but equally, there are some circumstances where the phys physical attendance of a particular participant is necessary in the interests of justice. So we're working our way through that. But don't believe that technology is a panacea uh, for all the problems that we, we have. Now, I think that's enough on that. And I must now move to the um, law student uh, essay competition. Now, this is, I think you, many of you will know, some of you won't, but this is being launched to celebrate the 15th anniversary of um, the ILBF seems to me as if it's been with us for much longer um, but I had quite a lot of dealings with it when I when I became a judge of the Court of Appeal when when uh, John Thomas was Lord Chief Justice one of the things he appointed me to do he will probably not remember this was chair the judges council library and online resources committee and uh, it shows you that if you involve yourself with books it can do you some good but um, uh, one of the things that I quickly became involved in was, was organising, or helping to organise, I should say, I mustn't take credit, um, the, the, the response of the Royal Courts of Justice um, to providing texts. So 15th, 15th um, anniversary. And it provides, the, the essay competition provides an opportunity for all students currently studying law at university in the United Kingdom uh, to think about how the practice of the law will be transformed over the next decade and to engage with uh, legal practitioners and to have the chance to win an exciting prize. Now, the next decade, I now understand why that was chosen because uh, Professor Suskind is one of the judges and he was telling us that by 2030, everything will have been changed and all of us can spend our whole time sitting on the beach 
drinking pina coladas and reading Kindles because there won't be anything for us to do, or I think that was the thesis. But the, the essay topic is uh, this, looking back from 2030, what should we do now to transform the legal profession, including by the use of machine learning technology to ensure access to justice uh, and that the profession is as diverse as the communities and businesses it serves. Now, if you listen carefully to what Professor Suskind said, those of you who think of entering the competition, you may already have something of a structure, but I won't give um, anything further away. Um, the competition is launching today. There will be an online question and answer with some of the judging team via video link on the 1st of December. The deadline for submitting um, the essays is the 28th of February uh, next year, and the winner will be announced by Lord Thomas uh, and Professor Suskind on the 31st of March. Now, entrants, of course, will be delighted to enter simply for the pleasure of thinking about an interesting topic, doing some research, and committing their thoughts to writing. But for those who need incentive, there are prizes. The first prize, I think, I think these are in order, the, the first prize is a week's internship in 2022 um, at Brown Rudnick's London office um, with, I'm not going to mention money because it's vulgar, but a, a, a decent contribution to the expenses that might be incurred in, 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 in attending. And uh, then the other thing is that the winning essay will be published in the International Bar Association's Litigation Committee's newsletter in May, uh, and um, it, it will also go on Brown Rudnick's website. And the runners-up will also, there will be two runners-up, have their uh, essays published. Now, there's a very distinguished team of judges. I've mentioned a couple of them, but um, the, 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 those who are likely to want to enter this competition will be in awe of the very distinguished um, judges. But can I mention three who are very distinguished in many respects and will be in the future, but who are just embarking on their um, legal careers. Um, the first is Yasmin Hassan. There you are. Um, the second is Achara Yuritso. I hope I've pronounced that correctly or nearly correctly. And the third is um, James Yang. Where's James? He's on Zoom, all right. Um, so for anyone who, who, who wishes to talk to those who are here, um, you're available for discussion and no doubt James will be making himself available uh, at the uh, Zoom event in a week or so's time. So that's the essay competition. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't have time to cover the other three topics that uh, were identified in the note I was sent, but it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much.